Good day. Today is October 30th, which is really important because if you listen to this a few days later, uh, events might have changed. So bear in mind when this was recorded and not when you're listening uh, to the news, because as I said, things will change uh, and they seem to be changing every day. Uh, allow me to start today by reading you a small paragraph from an article by um, Chris, Nicholas Kristof, uh, and I think it was the Sunday New York Times. It reads, Israel faces an agonizing challenge, a neighboring territory is ruled by well-armed terrorists who have committed unimaginable activities aimed to commit more I mean, atrocities, I'm sorry, and aim to commit more and now shelter in tunnels between a pop, in a population of more than 2 million people. It's a nightmare. But the sober question must be, what policies will reduce the risk, not influence it, while honoring intrinsic values of Palestinian lives as well as Israeli lives? I think this is a good way to... Um, to start, uh, I think no one questions uh, the seriousness of the atrocities committed in Israel and a right of a state to respond to these atrocities. But now, of course, the question arises, is it justified, therefore, to commit a whole bunch of atrocities in response? And it seems to me that is the current debate. And it's also useful to point out that the Biden administration has been 100% supporters of Israel. In fact, they're talking about sending even more arms to Israel, even though on the margin or as the last sentence, both President Biden and the Secretary of State have sort of said, well, but, you know, human rights and so forth should not be violated. So if one looks this from the outside, uh, outside the U.S., um, then one would might say the following things. I've just sort of summarized it from the various uh, events and articles. First, my white one say, that the U.S. should be defending Israel because it's backing a country that, I'm sorry, the U.S. is backing, not to defend, the U.S., I'm being incoherent, sorry. The U.S. is backing a country right now, namely Israel, that, that has breached international law by building, one, Jewish settlements in occupied territories, Two, reject a trade statehood for the Palestinians. Three, accused of uh, imposing collective punishment on the Palestinians and committing war crimes of all sorts in Gaza. And from the perspective of most people in the world, that is what U.S. policy currently looks like. And furthermore, uh, U.S. is... Uh, attaching itself to these uh, its current policies of wholehearted support of the state of Israel uh, by being one, I think, of 11 or 14 countries in the General Assembly. Uh, the resolution was, by normal standards, fairly mild, uh, concerning itself with the human rights and international law violations in Gaza. Uh, and has vetoed, was used, used to veto in the Security Council against the resolution that was more or less supported by everybody, Europe, uh, third world countries, etc., which also expressed its concern about the humanitarian issues and violation of international law. And I think maybe today there was a similar resolution uh, offered by one of the um, Arab Emirates, I believe, and I don't know as yet know uh, how the U.S. voted, but it was said that the U.S. would veto the resolution again. So on the one hand, you have the disaster in Palestine, and I want to talk a couple of minutes about that and then talk more about U.S. policy. 
The disaster in Palestine, as you've heard over and over again on the news, so I will just summarize and not bore you with it. There are roughly speaking 2.3 million people in Gaza, of which 40% or slightly higher than 40% are children. The Israeli government, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Hamas has told uh, the population that it should move south because it's um, uh, bombing. Uh, I'm being confused today. The, uh, the, the, the population in Gaza has been told to move south, both by Hamas and by the Israelis, in terms of the bombing largely taking place in northern Gaza. That means one million or slightly more than one million people have to march through a fairly destroyed northern Gaza to go to southern Gaza where there is no room for them, where there's no food for them, where there's no water for them. And on top of it, uh, they also are seeing bombings taking place uh, in um, southern Gaza, right? So it's not as if there's no bombings in southern Gaza. Now, of course, uh, Israel has entered with the, Gaza with tanks. Uh, but just imagine the situation, I mean, you've seen it visually on the TV, of a population in the southern part of state, which was dense to begin with, now having double the population. And again, almost 50% of the population that has moved from north to south um, is, in fa- is in fact composed of, of children. Now, the second description to be given is that there are hospitals throughout Gaza, mostly run, by the way, by international agency, International Red Cross, uh, WHO and so forth. Um, some of them are now out of commission because they have been bombed. And the major hospital still standing, which is somewhere in the middle of Gaza, is now being threatened. And perhaps by the time you hear this, has already been bombed. And the argument that Israel is making is that there are Hamas people hiding in the hospital and in the courtyard. Uh, the the doctors and the managers of that hospital are saying it may very well be that there are a few Hamas people around, but nobody has weapons. And the overwhelming majority of people in the hospital are seriously injured. In fact, people are now being operated on in the hallway. They're afraid of losing their electricity. Uh, they are in dire straits and very well by, may very well by the time you hear this, uh, have had to turn off the ventilators of small babies, etc. So the medical situation is a nightmare. And what Israel essentially is saying is it is their bombings are being justified because Hamas people are hiding everywhere. And therefore, the population just becomes collateral damage. Again, let me remind you, almost half the population are children. So um, what does one make of all of this? Uh, In terms of not just Hamas, which we know is a terrorist organization, but in terms of the international community and the international system. Let me remind you that um, the US entry or support, not physical entry of support of the Ukraine was in the name of the UN Charter. That is to say, the Russians were violating the sovereignty and the human rights of Ukrainians. At this particular point, we seem to be okay with the Israelis violating the human rights and all kinds of international law in Gaza because it is entitled to do so because of the massacres of Israelis. It may be justifiable in the minds of some, but it happens not to be justifiable in the minds of most people in the world, including most heads of state and governments, even amongst our allies. 
uh, it is been the sort of hallmark of the post-World War II period that after the civilian bombings in Dresden at the end of World War II and the use of atomic weapons in Japan, all of them aimed at civilians, that a whole body of international law should be founded of the rights of civilians and their protections and humanitarian uh, measures to be taken. And even in times of warfare, uh, that there are laws of war, modern laws of war and warfare, as well as humanitarian law that ought to be adhered to. And none of this is happening right now. It is not happening even to the extent that bringing in water and food uh, through uh, Egypt is not really being allowed by the Israelis. Uh, yes, a few trucks have come, I think a hundred or so, but bear in mind that the uh, regular traffic between Egypt and Gaza in terms of supplies used to be about a hundred, sometimes even 200 trucks a day of food and, and gasoline and medication and the rest of it. So Gaza was heavily supplied through that uh, entryway from Egypt. And now, not only was there no supply coming through, but when the some supply was allowed to come in, it is a trickle uh, after weeks of not allowing anything in. And so it in no way is meeting either the needs of the people in southern Gaza, nor the needs of the refugees which are coming from northern Gaza, which have been told to leave and get out of the way in, um, in northern, northern Gaza. This in some ways is the biggest human catastrophe that we have seen in a long time. And it is uh, being uh, committed by an industrial country, uh, Egypt, uh, Israel, with the help of the biggest power, military power, the United States. Now, if you are on, mainly concerned about Israel and what happened in Israel and say, well, of course, look what happened. They're justified in doing anything to get the hostages out and to destroy Hamas. Then the next question becomes, okay, under certain circumstances, this is allowed, and the international community should allow it, and on other circumstances, it shouldn't. Are there two standards here? And that's worth worth pondering. The other thing that's worth um, pondering is that um, what is the end game here? That is to say, let's say 50, 60 percent of the infrastructure, the hospitals, the, the private housing and so forth is all destroyed at the end of whenever it is that Israel feels that it has made, done enough damage to, uh, to Hamas. Uh, then what? Who's going to run Gaza? Uh, Israel's not going to run Gaza. Uh, can the uh, West Bank uh, Palestinian Authority run Gaza? Not in the kind of shape it's in. Will you build in an international structure? Will a group of countries get together and run Gaza? Who is going to pay for the rebuilding of Gaza? Presumptively, the international community, the donor countries, the United States. Uh, is, is, is this going to cost billions? to rebuild that country? Or should all the people who are now in Gaza be moved to the West Bank? Well, first of all, it's not very practical for a comment I would make in a minute, but it's also the case that um, to move a couple of million people to some other location against their will, why would it be against their will? Wouldn't all Palestinians want to leave Gaza? Well. God, the Palestinians in Gaza were refugees from where Israel is now. So they don't attach themselves particularly to the West Bank. They can't go home again because Israel is now 
Israel. Uh, and so they themselves are refugees, and they some many of them, not maybe all of them, but many of them, attach themselves to the notion that they want they've been displaced once, they don't want to be displaced the second time. So it is a monumental mess. And I would propose to you that no one knows the end game or the answer. And I would also like to propose to you that um, first, this ha also has had a big impact on the West Bank, which I want to talk about two minutes. And it has had a big impact internal to the United States and the view of the United States and the rest of the world. Now, internal to, um, to that part of the world, you have a situation in the West Bank, right, where Palestinians, you never have gotten a two-state solution. You have an ever-expanding Jewish settlements. And as we speak, a few hundred Palestinians have been killed by either the Israeli army or by settlers while this stuff is going on in Gaza. And it's getting less of a of attention of attention in the news. So not only is there the mess in Gaza, but you have the mess on the West Bank, which also does not have an easy solution and which also is accelerating. In addition, you have the geographic area. We know Iran is involved. We know for sure that many of the arms and so forth in Gaza come from Iran. It is not clear that Iran told Hamas to uh, go into um, Israel and slaughter people there. But it is the case that Iran is involved in Lebanon because Hezbollah in Lebanon essentially is being supported by Iran. Iran has Syria in its pocket. It has parts of, because of Lebanon, Syria, and then uh, Yemen, uh, the Houthis are also supported by, by Iran. So Iran has a big stake in all of this and is in some senses participating. And there is still the fear that the Hezbollah will, um, counter to its own interest, actually, will in fact uh, begin to have a, a, a more heated conflict. There's already some conflict uh, with Israel. So Israel will be fighting on two fronts. And Lebanon itself is a mess, right? And Hezbollah for sure is armed by the Iranians. And there is uh, then a conflagration in the Middle East that no one knows how to stop. And this, then the, uh, you know, the peacemaking efforts with Israel and some of its Arab neighbors, the Abraham Accords, and the forthcoming, which is now disintegrated a linkage of having Saudi Arabia recognize Israel and get some benefits from that with the US, et cetera. All of that is now in total disarray. It's hard to know how the genie is being put back in the bottle. And also it's very hard to know whether or not in the next few days or few weeks, the uh, conflict between Israel and Gaza will expand and others in the area. When that happens, uh, we are all in a major nightmare. Uh, that part of the world, the Middle East, is unstable under the best of circumstances. And the loss of human life and the disarray in that part of the world will be absolutely mind-boggling, even compared to what's going on there. So in some senses, the escalation of conflict between Israel and Gaza and Israel seeking revenge in Gaza has fundamentally altered actually, and even worse, potentially, the entire part of that world. And this is in the midst of Ukraine, which Europe is engaged in, in the midst of U.S. conflicts and trying to find some kind of peaceful solutions with China and Taiwan, uh, and that doesn't explode. In other words, the world, as we speak, is in a monumental mess. So let me just briefly turn to U.S. policy here. It is understandable that the Biden administration 
is all out in support of Israel, especially after what happened in Israel. It is not quite as understandable to many Americans of the fact that the U.S. is less critical of what the Israelis are doing in terms of violating international law and humanitarian law, because after all, that is what we have been preaching for years, and we have, you know, criticized others, and we have justified, as I said, Western intervention and help in the Ukraine on the very basis. So this looks somewhat hypocritical to some. If it's our friends, well then, all right, if they're violating human rights and international law, well, we'll you know, criticize mildly around the edges, but basically we think they're entitled to do so. Um, and if it's uh, you know some other part of the world, then we go gung ho. I would like to suggest to you that all of this is not just an external to the U.S. matter, and therefore we in the United States can say, you know, we're in the U.S. This is not really affecting us all that much. But I would like to propose to you that this will have a made what's going on is going to have a major impact in U.S. policy. It is and, and politics in the future. It is not merely that the U.S. population is divided between those who are 100 percent pro-Israel versus those who are somewhat critical of what is going on in Gaza right now. So it's not just that. It is the fact that a considerable proportion of Americans um, are uh, so dismayed at U.S. uneven not being even-handed and not dealing with the Gaza crisis as, and considering as seriously as a slaughter in Israel, uh, that one of two things will happen. One, people will not vote for the uh, Biden as the next president, and or even more so, uh, it's not just that they're going to vote for somebody else, I think there's a good case to be made <clears throat> that many younger progressives in American uh, politics, as well as the many people of Arab um, uh, Muslim extraction who are American citizens and who vote, uh, will simply not vote. They won't be willing to vote for the Republicans, but they're simply going to be unwilling to vote for Biden. You're going to say, well, all right, so they're not going to vote. But let me emphasize for you that that might actually mean the Republicans could win in the next election. Then, for example, and you might have read some of this in the newspapers or analysis, the state of Michigan. The state of Michigan and Detroit in particular has a very large Arab Muslim population. Uh, those folks uh, are capable of being the swing vote between the Democrats and Republicans uh, uh, voting, um, being voted into office. The margin in the state of Michigan is such that progressives in Michigan, and especially Arab Americans, if they just don't go to the polls, the Republicans can easily win. So this is just one example, and I give you many other examples of how the American election outcome may in fact be affected by this. And it would be kind of useful uh, to take that into account because this is not just all distant stuff out there. This might be very well the difference between us, let's say, getting Trump as the next president or Biden. So this has very serious implications inside the U.S. The other serious political implication has, has to do with the view of the U.S. in other international affairs and other international matters. Because no matter how congenial other countries found Israel to be or how much they were aligned with Israel, there is almost no support anymore for what Israel is doing in Gaza. And that makes U.S. relations with other countries also very difficult, and it makes the U.S. look very hypocritical. Yes, of course, the horror that was visited upon Israel should be uh, commented upon, and yes, Israel has a right to respond, but a right 
it really mean to decimate a civilian population, to make life for them almost impossible, to kill thousands of children in the name of you know, defeating your enemy Hamas and liberating uh, uh, people that Hamas has captured. I think that internationally, this is playing out very badly. And it is very unfortunate that some of the response in this country, as soon as somebody speaks up and says, yes, what happened in Israel was awful, but what's happening in Gaza is awful, and trying to be more even-handed about it, uh, people who feel that the U.S. is not being even-handed about it uh, are uh, going to be rather difficult to deal with for the U.S. in the future. And yelling at them and saying, well, that they're just anti-Semitic, is really unfair. Of course, there's anti-Semitism in the world. And of course, that has to be taken into account. And of course, this has heightened anti-Semitism. But the way to respond to this is not to keep calling people anti-Semitic, but rather to, have, to strategize for the US and the international community policies that say, okay, Israel has rights to defend itself, but is there a modern right, a contemporary right to decimate a civilian population and infrastructure and uh, target uh, as, you know, sort of side casualties, uh, thousands of children, thousands of innocent uh, uh, Gazans. Uh, and by the way, uh, at least half the Gazan population, if not more so, at least in the um, polls in recent years, doesn't support ha Hamas to begin with. So this sort of collective punishment, which is uh, people thought was anathema and whenever after the Second World War, and whenever uh, those were violated, the U.S. was historically at the forefront of saying international law needs to be upheld. And now it's, it's viewed based on at least the uh, policies and attitudes of the current administration, viewed as being willing to allow an ally, in this case Israel, to disregard all the norms that we've been holding other countries up to, whether they achieved uh, holding up those norms or something is a slightly different question, but we certainly have been preaching it. Finally, let me just spend two minutes on something I want to talk in, about in the future, and that is the international institutions. Uh, the UN institutions, as well as non-governmental institutions, everybody is involved, but not necessarily effectively so, either because they can't, because they're barred from bringing in help from the outside, but is uh, also ineffective in overcoming other obstacles. Uh, there are millions and millions of dollars being spent to help the Gazan population. And yet um, they can't do it against barriers to enter, enter the place. But it's also showing once again that there's been an erosion of the role that international institutions are playing. And the fact that international institutions find it difficult uh, to play the role that was designed for them and need to change to some extent, not just their role, but their their agendas, uh, is also brought out and brought to bear in this particular case. Suffice it to say that even the Secretary General, you will recall about a week or so, condemned both Israel and, the, and Hamas, but said this needs to be seen, I'm not quoting his words exactly, in historical context. And immediately the uh, the representative of Israel got up and said that he should resign because this was an unbelievable comment for the Secretary of the General to have made. You may recall that Secretary General Guterres, who by the way is Portuguese in origin, uh, came back the next day and repeated his statement. He said that you know Israel was badly um, assaulted but he also condemned uh, the, what is going on now. 
And he tried to say what is happening both in terms of Israel and God's and policies has to be seen in historical context. That is to say, the absence of a Palestinian state, never achieving a two-state solution, uh, people in Gaza being essentially uh, roped in without any way to get out or do anything. So he, in some senses, was saying what a head of an institution should say, which is in order to fix this problem, one needs to see what caused this problem. And what caused this problem is not simply Hamas killing some Israeli, but Israelis and doing horrendous things to Israelis, but rather it needs to be seen in the unsatisfactory circumstances of Israel, its former inhabitants like the Palestinians, the West Bank with ever expanding settlements and uh, killings by the settlers of Palestinians who live in the West Bank and vice versa and so forth. So in insofar as there's ever going to be a resolution of all of this, one can't start in the next, last few weeks, one eventually has to look at what has produced these circumstances and can the context and the circumstances be fixed or ameliorated because otherwise, uh, you know, it is just going to be mayhem and every few years you will have a catastrophe in that part of the world. And I think that's what he was trying to say. He was just trying to say, you can't just see this in the narrow activities of the last few weeks. You have to see both the cause of this as well as the solution of this in terms of how to how it all came about and how to ultimately fix it. Um, in that sense, I think he was making good sense and he was taking some leadership. But as we know, he was immediately attacked and even told by the Israelis to resign, which he has not done and probably shouldn't do. It's a very complex situation. I know people have strong feelings about it, but it needs to be now discussed, not just in terms of Israel, but Israel in terms of Gaza, and not just in terms of Gaza, but in terms of any some kind of long-term solution for the Palestinians. Otherwise, there will be no peace in that part of the world, if you ask my opinion and in the opinion of most observers. Thank you very much, and we'll see you again in two weeks.